If we're being honest, uh, if you are using a read through the Bible in a year program, uh, when you get to Genesis, that's exciting. Exodus, very exciting. Then you get to Leviticus, and uh, it sort of becomes the dry spot on the water slide of your uh, of your uh, read through the Bible program. Uh, however, the book of Leviticus has a number of tremendously rich and meaningful passages in it, and. Uh, in chapter 16, for example, we read that the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Uh, Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering, and of a ram as a burnt offering, and then he goes on to describe further ritual and such involved in what we come to know as the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. Uh, it's, uh, Yom Kippur actually is happening basically right now on the 9th of Tishri at sundown until the 10th of Tishri uh, at midnight uh, here in the States. Basically, that puts us at the 11th and 12th. Um, of, Oct- of October this year. And so uh, today I want to take a minute and talk a little bit about Yom Kippur as the Day of Atonement. Um, this passage in Leviticus uh, is, uh, as mentioned in verse 1, connected back with chapter 10 when Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's two sons, offered profane fire on the altar and God struck them dead. Uh, here in chapter 16, we see God responding to that event, not responding in terms of him not having known what was coming, but rather in connection with that event, he gives Israel the day of atonement. And as the chapter goes on, we see that there is uh, atonement for uh, the holy place, which was profaned by Nadab and Abihu, uh, atonement for the priest and the priestly group, the Levites who would serve in the temple uh, or the tabernacle at this point, uh, and then for the people of Israel as well. And as it ch- says at the end of the chapter, this shall be an everlasting statute uh, for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. And so um, we see here again the beginnings of what we can know as the Day of Atonement. Um, the Day of Atonement in the Jewish, uh, in Israel's calendar and in their life was a monumentally important day. As a matter of fact, the Day of Atonement is the most important and solemn day of the Jewish calendar. Uh, this is where uh, historically throughout the Old Covenant, uh, this is where once a year the high priest would go into the holy place uh, with the blood of, of the bull, as mentioned here, and he would sprinkle that blood uh, from, that, uh, from that offering uh, on the mercy seat. Now, what is the mercy seat? Well, if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, and I'll use a pop reference because I can never really resist, but if you want a sort of a, a, a realistic visual of what we're talking about, you could think of Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant that Indy and Sala pull out of this pit here, uh, the well of the souls and that kind of thing. But the actual Ark of the Covenant in the movie does seem pretty solid in regard to its uh, um, uh, what it likely would have looked like in Israel's time. Well, if you think of the Ark, the mercy seat is the lid with the two cherubs with, uh, with their heads bowed and their wings extended out toward one another. And um, so the mercy seat was the top covering piece for the Ark of the Covenant in which uh, was Aaron's rod that budded, uh, the, uh, a jar of manna, the broken uh, tablets of the law, and blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat by the high priest once a year after many ceremonial washings and cleansings and purification rites. He would then enter beyond the veil uh, the veil in Solomon's time in the temple is, uh, tradition tells us that this veil was so thick and thickly woven that it would take a team of mules on both sides pulling on it in order to rend it. Uh, it was a very, very thick and intimidating veil. Uh, and I like to use that particular uh, picture because I think it is intended by God um, to, uh, and certainly by Solomon, but I think there's something about it that conveys the idea of the holiness of God as being unapproachable uh, beyond the veil. Uh, matter of fact, in the tabernacle era, in the time when the tabernacle was in Shiloh and such, 
um, and even wandered, obviously, through the wilderness in that. The presence of God would hover over the Holy of Holies uh, in uh, uh, over the tabernacle area in that. And so um, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And uh, this was the very presence of God um, uh, manifested to the people of Israel. Now, all of that to say that the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat meant that when God looked at the broken law in the Ark of the Covenant, he would see it through the shed blood. And in that picture is a foreshadowing, really, of the work of Christ. God looks at mankind and the violation of his holiness, the breaking of his law, the offending of him, but he sees it now through the shed blood of Christ. Uh, in regard to the Passover, this is why John would say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's all these wonderful Ill illustrations, imagery, and pictures uh, that God has baked into uh, the Old Covenant law and its rituals and practices and such that paint a very clear picture of the person and finished work of Christ. It could be uh, what we're talking about in the Day of Atonement. It could be the Passover. It could be the tabernacle itself. Uh, the, uh, the, the elements of the tabernacle are a fascinating study, again, of the person and work of Christ. So God has created all this imagery and such in these elements and, uh, and holy days and practices with the intent that, like Paul would say in Galatians 3, that we would see the law as a schoolmaster. Of course, the, uh, the, the statutes that they were to follow, but also that would include then the rituals and such. Uh, these things would all ultimately point to Christ. They served as a tutor, a schoolmaster, to, to lead us to the very person and work of Christ. And so um, the Day of Atonement today is from a, uh, I hesitate to say from a, uh, a New Testament, uh, well, I don't want to hesitate to say that, from a New Testament perspective. In other words, now that Christ has in fact come, uh, that he has, in fact, shed his blood for the remission of our sin, that we are now washed clean and purified in a way that the Old Testament sacrifices could never fully do. They could cover for a time, but they did not actually take away. Uh, as a matter of fact, goodness, the uh, illustration of the scapegoat uh, with the red ribbon tied around his neck to distinguish him from the other uh, goat that would be used in this, um, this practice um, the, the priest would put his hand upon the scapegoat, uh, signifying the transferring of his sin and the sin of the people upon this animal. And then the goat would be released off into the wilderness where it would run off and be seen no more. And it would ultimately uh, symbolize the idea of sin being taken away from the people. Well, in Christ, this actually happened. It wasn't a symbol anymore. It was a accomplished, fully realized reality is that now sin has been atoned for. Uh, John would say in his first letter that he is, uh, in chapter 2, he is the pr uh, propitiation for our sin and not ours only, but for the whole world. Uh, he ultimately, as the only one who could not only cover, but far beyond just covering, completely take away the sin of the world. Uh, so um, it is a commemorative thing for us to see the Day of Atonement today. However, for those who are Jews uh, under, who still see themselves under the Old Covenant, in other words, not Messianic Jews, but rather those who uh, would still be uh, the children of Israel, they, they look at the Day of Atonement as a day of reflection over their sin and confessing their sin and praying for forgiveness for, uh, uh, to, to end the one year and stepping with a clean slate into the new year and such. The beauty of the finished work of Christ is that uh, is that there is no longer a covering or an offering for sin. Why? Because Christ has ultimately taken our sin upon himself. I think the author to Hebrews in chapter 9 of, of the book of Hebrews actually um, illustrates this beautifully. I'd like to read the first 15 verses of chapter 9 of Hebrews. Uh, by the way, if you have not spent time in the book of Hebrews, it is a challenging but really rewarding, deep, rich book because its foundational uh, undercurrent is that Christ is greater than. 
Uh, and so therefore, when it talks about the offerings and the sacrifices, uh, Christ is greater than all of the Old Testament sacrifices. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater. He brings a greater rest than Joshua could lead the people of Israel into in the promised land. And here in chapter 9, uh, the author tells us about how Christ is greater in regard to his offering. So in chapter 9, verse 1, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared for the first part, uh, the first part in which, uh, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, uh, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or we sometimes say the holy of holies which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot uh, that had the, uh, the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Again, much more could be said about those things. Now, when the, these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. In other words, the priests and their responsibility lay in the holy place, performing the various offerings, sacrifices, rituals, things like this. However, into the second part, the high priest alone went once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and the fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. So in other words, these things were a foreshadowing. They were an illustration. They were to be uh, followed and practiced and fulfilled in, in terms of the responsibilities, but they could only go so far. They could not accomplish ultimately what the, the picture of what they were all about was intended to accomplish. And so it goes on in verse 11 and now brings it full all the way around. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, which the greater uh, and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not of the blood of goats and of calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, this is an interesting passage. It seems to be implying that there is, in fact, a temple in heaven, uh, a holy place in heaven, something, whether an actual temple of sorts or uh, in heaven's reality, whatever that looked like, but something akin to a holy of holies, that the temp tabernacle on earth was a an image of, a reflection of, a type of, a uh, an earthly representation of. And Christ went into the holy of holies with his own blood and sprinkled the mercy seat, as it were. That's an amazing thing to consider. Uh, and um, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. In other words, not just year to year to year, but now once for all, it is finished, paid in full, as he would say from the cross. He now offered eternal redemption. It is now completed. That which was in part is now in whole. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle, uh, sprinkling the unclean uh, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more, again, Christ is greater, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal uh, spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal of the eternal inheritance. Paul would put it this way in Colossians. Let me read this. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Um, bringing these ideas together. Uh, the Day of Atonement today, 
as it is practiced, as it, as it has always been practiced, all the way since the times of the giving of that command in Leviticus. Uh, these things are a representation of something that, again, in Colossians, Paul would say, was a shadow, but the substance is of Christ. In other words, he is the reality. He is the fullness, the fulfilling of, the completion of, the uh, the one who accomplishes all that the model and picture was intended to convey. Um, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In other words, it is now finished because he accomplished it fully. Everything the law was intended to accomplish, but could not because of our fallenness. Uh, for us, we could not do those things. So Christ, he who uh, he made him, the Father made the Son, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We could never achieve it or earn it. We have become it by virtue of his imputing to us his righteousness uh, and having taken our sin upon himself. And so therefore the day of atonement is not one that we look back on and say, and for those uh, our, our, our Jewish uh, friends uh, and such, uh, this is not something that accomplishes something per se, but it points to something. It points to Yeshua, it points to Jesus, the one who is in fact uh, the eternal redemption. He is the one who has taken it all upon himself and has satisfied God's righteous requirement uh, in the law. Again, 1 John 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. He is the full satisfaction of the righteous indignation of God against sin. Um, Romans chapter 3 and 4, the idea of uh, of, of his righteousness being imputed to us and our sin no longer being imputed to us, but rather instead Christ having taken it away by virtue of his substitutionary death. And so the Day of Atonement is a, is a beautiful model and picture for us to consider. I think even as Christians, it's helpful for us to consider all of the imagery that is there because that imagery helps us to see all the more clearly the person and the work of Christ Jesus. And so a very blessed and hopefully uh, a very blessed day of remembrance in the Day of Atonement uh, with the recognition of the completed, fulfilling, finished, thorough, completely accomplished work of Christ by his own shedding of his own blood uh, and even his own presenting of it upon the mercy seat in heaven, as it were. Um, what a glorious picture and what a glorious reality for you and I. You and I have been reconciled to God by virtue of that offering and sacrifice. And so um, there is value in recognizing the Jewish feast days and, and uh, understanding them for what they are if we are willing to see the, the, the person and work of Christ in them. This is one grand example of probably the highest, uh, maybe akin with Passover in that, the idea of the picture that is there. Um, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's rich, and I thought it would just be worth taking a few moments to consider these things from the Word of God. So thanks for joining in today. And as we bring this around to a close, um, even if you're unfamiliar with the Old Testament imagery in that, even if you are not even necessarily familiar biblically with so much of what we uh, just were, talk, we're talking about here, um, it is important for you to become familiar with a couple of very important things. First and foremost, the scriptures teach us all that we are in need of being redeemed. We are slaves to sin, and therefore we need someone to come and pay uh, the price of our release, our freedom. We need someone to come and to take away the yoke of bondage that we are under in the law, uh, and even in our conscience. We are, by definition and even just by entrance into humanity, we are sinners because of Adam's fall. But you and I have been given the opportunity, the freedom, uh, a freedom that is found only in Christ, if we will, in fact, receive that. Uh, what remains is simply for us to receive what has already been accomplished by the finished work of Christ, who, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, has, uh, according to the scripture, in other words, this was always God's plan, that we would recognize that um, Christ would come. He would die on the cross for our sins. He would be buried and he would rise again the third day um, as, as, as the accomplishing of, of what John records in very, very memorable and simple uh, words. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever 
would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There is no other way for someone to be saved but through the finished work of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so this may seem narrow. This may seem restrictive in some way. It is actually the single most liberating uh, thing, not only in the fact that it is entirely accomplished in Christ, but that he cleared away all the debris, cleared away all the confusion, he cleared away all the smoke, and he said, if you want to know the path to everlasting life, it is ultimately found by putting your trust in me. Jesus was asked one day, what must I do to do the works of God? This is a question most people wrestle with because we all feel as though if we just try hard enough, we can be good enough to stand before God and deserve to be in heaven. But the truth of the matter is, is that we can't. Uh, Isaiah tells us that all of our all of our righteousness, the things that we see as being that which justifies us, are actually like filthy rags. They're worthless. They they're they're nothing you'd ever think of presenting uh, as being good and beautiful. But they're actually filthy and disgusting. There's, that we have no capacity to earn it. But rather instead, in answering that question, Jesus said, "This is what you do to do the works of God: to believe in the one whom." he has sent. So we are invited to come and put our trust in Christ Jesus, who who himself and alone took our sin upon himself. I'll I'll repeat a a passage I quoted earlier from 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin. The Father made the Son, God incarnate, uh, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so, let me just present you with an opportunity to put your trust in Christ right now. You, you may not have ever thought of these things, and now all of a sudden you find yourself understanding your actual condition. You, like me, like everybody else in the world in history, other than Jesus himself, are a sinner. It's inescapable. It is the, it's, it's what we are by virtue of being human. We don't become sinners when we sin. We actually sin as an expression of the fact that we are sinners. That's why we can never live perfectly, and we can't make up for the sins that we've already committed. And so we find ourselves in an absolutely hopeless condition, if not for Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, who has made the way for us to be saved. And so, let me invite you to put your trust in him right now. What I'm going to do is simply pray. I'm going to give you an opportunity to express some ideas that you may have never thought about giving words to. Uh, But this is a moment for you to ask him to pour out his grace upon you, to make you a new creation in Christ, um, to grant you everlasting life. This is not something you can earn. It is something that must be given to you, or the Bible term again is imputed, the idea of him declaring you righteous by faith in Christ Jesus. Does it mean you'll be perfect in the way that you live for the rest of your life? I wish it were so. We certainly want to walk with God in holiness. We don't want to walk in sin anymore. Clearly, the call is to leave behind that life that you once lived in sin and to walk in holiness and righteousness before God. We need the Holy Spirit to help us with that, but that becomes our desire as followers of Jesus. And so you will find yourself and your life being changed as you continue to just submit to him day after day. But your standing with him is established by putting your trust in Christ Jesus. And that being the case, when you do, you can know with assurance that you will stand before God unafraid and unashamed because you're not claiming your own righteousness. You are trusting in the finished work of Christ. The evidence for that will be your changed life, but the reality of that really is rooted in the finished work of Christ. So let me invite you to come and receive Jesus today. Father, we thank you for the grace and goodness that you've given us. We thank you that even though we are completely undeserving of it, Jesus died for sinners like us. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And we thank you that you made him, your son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so we are very grateful, grateful beyond words really, that our atonement has been satisfied, paid for, accomplished, provided fully in the person of Christ in whom we trust. And we thank you that on that day when we see you face to face, because of him, We will not have to be afraid or ashamed, but will be received, accepted in the beloved to enter into your eternal kingdom. So thank you for this. Father, for those who have never come to that place of putting their trust in Christ Jesus, those who've never received the grace and favor that you give through him, we just pray that right now in this moment, they would 
realize the weight of their sin, that they would recognize their hopelessness apart from Jesus, that they'd be willing and ready now to put their trust in you and for you to make them new and to daily walk with you until they see you face to face. We pray that they don't take this lightly, that this is not something to be taken for granted, but rather something to be taken advantage of, the opportunity to come and be made free in Christ Jesus, not free to sin, but free from the penalty of sin and daily in walking in the Holy Spirit to be more and more free every day from that bondage, those shackles of living in sin that they are entrapped by now. Thank you, God, for all of your goodness and grace. And I would just ask you to put it in their hearts to join me in prayer right now. If that's you, I invite you to pray with me this very simple prayer. But it's important that we mean these things from our heart, that we are truly ready to begin to follow Jesus. So let me invite you to pray now. Heavenly Father, I do confess to you that I am a sinner. I have kept you at arm's length. I've rejected you on so many levels. I have not walked with you. I have not trusted in you. But today I recognize the weight of my sin. I understand now that I am separated from you because of my sin. But I thank you that Jesus paid for my sin, past, present, and future that in him I can be made free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I believe that he died for my sin, was buried, and rose again the third day, and I put my trust in him, in him alone, as the way, the truth, and the life, apart from whom I have no chance of being in your presence, but because of whom I too can now stand in your presence, forgiven, unashamed. So thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love and your mercy. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit who will take up residence in my heart and help me each day to walk with Jesus and to pick me up when I fall and to help me to continue on. Make me a new creation in Christ and even newer every day in terms of the way that I live. I want to leave behind the old life that bound me and walk in the freedom that Christ provides. I thank you for loving me and saving me, and I would ask you to continually change me and make me more like Jesus. Thank you for all of these things. I don't deserve any of this, but I thank you that you are a loving and gracious Father, and I thank you that your Son has set me free. I praise you and bless you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to welcome you to the family of God. Praise the Lord for that. Um, I also want to encourage you, by the way, to be sure, this is really, really important, be sure to find a good uh, Bible teaching church uh, that you can be part of. Uh, Videos, podcasts, things like this are great as as a help Uh, Hopefully, this is helpful, but they can be helpful, but they're not the same thing as being in fellowship. So if it's at all possible for you, I would encourage you to find a good, solid Bible teaching church that you can grow in your faith and your relationship with Christ among other believers who are doing the same. You can give and receive and be part of a family of believers where you're uh, upholding each other and praying for one another and supporting one another and and, uh, being there with one another. Uh, it's also important that you spend time in the Word of God every day, that you, uh, that you read the Scripture, that you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you spend time in Bible studies and in times of prayer with fellow believers in that, um, that you would grow. Um, all of us start and we grow. It's, uh, the Bible says taking meat is like an infant in Christ in a way, and then eventually we grow to maturity and we take on the deeper things. But Uh, It's important that you do start and that you spend time in the Word of God. So get yourself a Bible. Um, Some of you ask sometimes which version I use. I use the New King James. It's uh, one I tend to go back to all the time. But find a Bible. uh, You know, go get a Bible if you don't have one already, and just make it a point to read it uh, and to pray about it and to and to uh, ask the Lord for further understanding and and be in a church again where your pastor is teaching the Word of God. Um, Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thanks for watching and listening. By the way, if you have any thoughts or questions, you're always welcome to share them. Uh, You can leave them in the comment section on these videos, or if you want to email me, you can do that at info at calvarychapelfranklin.com. Or if you want to hop on Telegram, you can find us at Parsons Pad Podcast, 
and uh, you can submit questions. You can also read articles that we post or we post these videos on there as well. So that being said, um, um, just very grateful that you could uh, join in today and I and, uh, hope this was helpful. So the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace forever. Amen.